President Joe, starring Bob Hope and his guest star, Hedda Hopper. Happy anniversary, Fibber McGee and Molly. Happy anniversary, Fibber McGee and Molly. If you're with me greeting or a springtime cleaning, throw away your brush and throw coat here. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Spring Cleaning Hope telling you to use Pepsodent, and while you're making your house spick and span, you won't hear a bridge click in your pan. <laughs> or, this, this is Bob Spring Cleaning Hope telling you to use Pepsodent because a brush in the hand is better than a vacuum in the puss. <laughs> Isn't that a wonderful joke? What a joke. I told that joke to Jimmy Roosevelt last week. Now he has to have a nurse steady. <laughs> well, this is the time. This is the time of the year we all start our own spring cleaning, now that Morgan saw it through with us. <laughs> but you should see me doing my spring house cleaning this week. We sure worked hard cleaning the living room. First I rolled the rug back, then I mowed the grass. <laughs> Found another rug. All year long, you know. All year long we keep we kept sweeping the dirt under the living room rug. In fact, the rug was so high, to get on it, you had to be the thief of Baghdad. <laughs> I saw the picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, where were you? But I want to tell you, I want to tell you, at our house, the dust was so thick, I had to probe for the furniture. There was so much dust around the house, the termites were running around yelling Gesundheit to each other. <laughs> And our oriental rug needed cleaning. In fact, the gopher had been living in it so long, he had slanted eyes. <laughs> and, but we're not worried about the rugs much because we have a good vacuum cleaner. Vacuum cleaner, that's Santa neat on a stick. And, <laughs> but we did clean. Today, first thing in the morning, I decided to go up and clean the attic. When I got up there, I came across a bunch of old Esquires in one corner. Tomorrow, first thing in the morning, I'm going to clean the attic. <laughs> But I really know how to clean house. I took the Venetian blinds down and put them in the electric washer and turned on the switch. Anybody want to buy 38,000 toothpicks? <laughs> and I hadn't, I hadn't changed the water in the goldfish bowl for two years, so I put some clean, fresh water in it. The goldfish swam to the top, took a breath of fresh air, and said, gosh, that was a long blackout. <laughs> and I got a few surprises, too. I opened one closet door, and I saw a man with a long white beard. I said, what are you doing in there? He said, I'm the exterminator. He pointed to a horse in one corner and said, I came in here 20 years ago to kill that mouse. <laughs> nice joke. <laughs> I know, I rolled that joke on the White House lawn yesterday. I did, yes, I did. But my house is really clean now. My paint started to fade a little, so I repainted the house with Pepsodent. Now I've got the only house in America whose bay window smiles at you. <laughs> May not be funny, but it's a plug. I got you there. <laughs> but everybody's cleaning. No kidding. One workman, one workman spent two days cleaning the windows of Hetty Lamar's house until she told me she'd call the police. And I had a, <laughs> and I had an accident while I was cleaning my house. I poured some glue on the piano stool by mistake. My uncle sat down on it yesterday. So far, he's played "I Hear a Rhapsody" three thousand times. <laughs> Bob, there's something I'd like to speak to you about. Why, certainly, William. What is it? Well, you know, Bob, I've been on your radio program for three years now, and in all that time, we've, we've never had a fight about money. That's right, Bill. In fact, you've never even mentioned it. <laughs> Wait a minute, William. I don't want you giving the audience the impression that I'm chief. Just to show you that my heart's in the right place, take this $1,000 bill. Oh, gee, thanks, Bob. And here's another $1,000 bill. Thanks. And another $1,000 bill. Thanks. Boy, will you be in a spot when television comes in. All right, so there are only one dollar bills. Does, does a little number make so much difference? Well, yes, Bob, a great deal of difference. For instance, numbers are mighty important when you're buying toothbrushes. The number 50 is the one to remember. For the new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush gives you more for your money. It's the only toothbrush that gives you twice the usual number of tufts in a small, compact head. Now, it's just simple arithmetic. Double the number of tufts means double the cleansing power. And double the cleansing power means brighter, more sparkling teeth, quicker than ever before. 
Well, just take a tip from me, ladies and gentlemen, and get one of those marvelous new Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrushes right away. There's a free gift waiting for you if you buy a new Pepsodent toothbrush now. For just a few days more, Pepsodent is offering you a free 25-cent size of Pepsodent toothpaste or tooth powder, whichever you prefer, with the purchase of every 50 Tough Toothbrush at the regular price of 50 cents. But you'll have to act quickly to get this valuable free gift. After a few days, the offer will be withdrawn. So go to your store, tell your salesman you want a Pepsodent 50 Tough Toothbrush, then choose your free gift, either Pepsodent Toothpaste or Pepsodent Tooth Powder in the 25-cent size. All you pay is the regular price of 50 cents for the toothbrush. Now, get yours right away while there's still time. <laughs> Our six hits and a miss in the orchestra in Hut Sut Song. The six hits and a miss are now six hits and a misses. Mm. In a little while, this program will have six hits and misses and a few quiz kids. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paulie and Jerry did it. Las Vegas. Where are we? Let's get into it. And now, and now it is my pleasure to present one of Hollywood's best known personalities screen actress, newspaper columnist, radio commentator, and wearer of Hollywood's dizziest hats, Miss Hedda Hopper, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Bob. I love that introduction, wearer of Hollywood's dizziest hats. Of course, my hat is a little tricky, isn't it? I'll say. I could hardly wait for 7 o'clock to see the cuckoo come out. <laughs> Why, Bob, it's my new Easter bonnet. Really? Does that thing lay an egg, huh? If I mean... Uh... <laughs> I wish you wouldn't bring that competition around here. Did you see me? Did you see me? <laughs> oh, it's all right. No, just let him... Did you see me in the... <laughs> Did you see me in the Easter parade Sunday morning, Hedda? Yes, and I really don't think you know how to dress, Bob. Don't know how, why? Didn't I look formal? Well, for one thing, you're not supposed to wear a top hat with bare feet. <laughs> Since when? I mean, uh... Oh, it clashes, eh? Well, if you'd taken a good look at me, Hedda, you'd have seen... You'd have seen I was wearing top hat, cutaway coat, and striped pants. Striped pants? Yeah, that was a good idea, drawing black lines in your long underwear. <laughs> Why, Hedda, I thought my outfit was a real production. I gave a lot of thought and study to it. Yes, it was an elaborate suit, Bob, but didn't you overdo it a little bit? Overdo it? I mean, having that midget trot along behind you carrying the extra pair of pants. <laughs> well, I gave that midget those pants. He cuts the pockets out and uses them for pillowcases. Hedda, I suppose... That's a long line for nothing. I suppose... <laughs> what am I doing? 
doing in there? Hedda, I suppose you spent a whole week figuring out your Easter outfit. Well, not exactly, Bob. I was busy with my own radio program. Oh, yes, Hedda Hopper's Hollywood. Yes, I broadcast for sun-kissed oranges and lemons. Well, I broadcast for Pepsi and toothpaste. You know, Bob, we're nothing but a couple of squirts. <laughs> yeah, well... <laughs> Look, I wonder if Pepsi and toothpaste and sun-kissed oranges have, have anything in common. Well, sure they have. To get the best out of them, you have to squeeze them both. Yeah. I know a couple of girls like that. Look, I... Uh, <laughs> I suppose you want to put in a plug for your product, Hedda. No, Bob. I only want to tell the folks how marvelous sun-kissed oranges are. They're luscious, juicy, big, delectable, and the best California can grow. All finished? Yes. Yeah. Okay, Florida, tune back in. <laughs> Are we bragging as though they were ever in? Isn't that marvelous? <laughs> Say, Bob, what do you do when you're not busy with radio and pictures? Well, I like to take a trip to Catalina, lie out on the beach, and admire the pretty girls in their bathing suits. And Edward G. Robinson thinks he's the sea wolf. <laughs> and while we're on the subject, I've heard a lot about you and Bill Goodwin standing on the corner of Vine Street. You hear that, Bill? Yeah, yes, I did, Bob. And let me tell you something. Only kids would stand on corners and whistle at girls. Only kids would try to flirt with girls. And only kids would try to kiss girls. Well, meet the men of Boys Town. <laughs> that did it, William. That did it. Well, if you boys can't get girls, before I was a Hollywood columnist, I was an advice to the Love Lawn editor. Maybe I can give you some advice. No, that wouldn't help, Hedda. I once went to a Love Lawn editor... That was quite a while ago when I was still a shy and bashful boy before I started to use Pepsodent. Pepsodent? Pepsodent, Pepsodent. All that ever comes out of you is Pepsodent. Well, shoot the stopper to me, Hopper. <laughs> what did you go to see the Love Lawn editor about, Bob? I suppose it was your first love affair. Yes, it was a sensational affair, Hedda. She was 16 and I was 18. What made you fall in love with her? Oh, I guess it was the way she handled a pool cue. No, it, but we came, to the, we came to the parting of the ways What broke up your romance? Well, her mother didn't like me She used to see me hanging around the runway in burlesque theaters It made her nervous when she was dancing <laughs> so, so the next day there I was, Hedda At the door of the advice to the lovelorn editor Come in Say, is this the advice to the lovelorn? Goodbye, Miss Hopper Goodbye, Mr. Barrymore This is it oh. Say... <laughs> Are, 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 are you to the, the advice to the Lovelorn editor? Why, yes. Here, let me take your hat and turtle. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, say, uh, you're a country boy, aren't you? Yes, I'm from the country. How'd you know? Well, never mind. I'll open the window. <laughs> you're about the most bashful boy I've ever seen. Say, do you always suck your thumb? Yep, can't quite reach my big toe anymore. <laughs> Well, tell me, what's your problem? Well, I, I broke up with my girl, Lula Bell. I ain't been able to sleep ever since. I'm always thinking about her. Well, perhaps I can help you. Why don't you describe Lula Bell to me? Well, her face ain't much to look at, but her figure, gee, it's awful. <laughs> we used to have a lot of fun together, but then I began to suspect she was going with another fella. Well, what made you think that? Well, every time I walk into the parlor, she's sitting there necking with him. <laughs> gee... I don't understand it. I don't understand why Lula Bell don't love me. Well, perhaps her family objected. What do her folks think of you? Well, her mother's away in an army camp. Her mother's in an army camp? Yeah. She always insisted on wearing the pants in the family, and this time she got drafted. <laughs> well, perhaps you're not romantic enough. Tell me, when the lights are low and there's soft music playing and you two are all alone in the room and all is still, what do you do? I eat peanuts. <laughs> Why? Well, I ain't the type to sit around and do nothing. <laughs> when did you realize that Lula Bell was beginning to slip away from you? Oh, just the other day. I was holding her in my arms, looking tenderly into her eyes, and then she puckered up her little lips. Yes, yes. What a time to blow a spitball. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry about her. You can get plenty of girls. You know, you're kind of cute. Here, let me fix your necktie for you. Oh, gee, we're standing this close to a woman... It gives me goose pimples all over. On you, it's an, it's an improvement. <laughs> oh, I, I sure must have You got some line. of that fuzz on your tongue there, you know. <laughs> that dropped down from that hat. Where Come are on. we? <laughs> Where are we? <laughs> <laughs> You'd think it was a bird's nest. <laughs> Can I send that on the road? Well, go ahead. Come on, handsome. Sit down here beside me. Oh, gosh. Do you, do you think it's safe? Well, 
Certainly, I won't bite you. Go ahead, I like it. <laughs> now, let me give you a few pointers. Next time you hold Lula Bell in your arms, run your fingers through her hair like I'm running mine through yours. Oh, oh, shucks, don't run your fingers through my hair. It keeps reminding me of something. Well, what's that? I gotta do my spring plowing. <laughs> oh, come on, how about a kiss? A kiss? What's that? Don't you know what a kiss is? Well, what does your mother do when your father comes from work and she sees him? Oh, slugging. <laughs> oh, no, I'll show you what a kiss is. <laughs> there. How did you like that? Uh, did we get across Sunset Boulevard all right? <laughs> Thank you, Hedda Hopper. Hedda will be back with us in a few minutes, folks. Take it. For oh, sentimental me, for romantic you Dreaming dreams is all that we can do We hang around all day and ponder While both of us grow fonder The Lord knows where we're wandering to I sit and sigh, you sigh and sit upon my knee We laugh and cry and never disagree A million kisses we'll make theft of Until there's nothing left of for romantic you and sentimental me Nothing left of poor romantic you and sentimental me. That's Skinny Annis, ladies and gentlemen. Skinny Annis and sentimental me. Say, Skinny, congratulations. I hear you're packing them in at the Wilshire Bowl. Well, thank you, Bob. You know I'm following Phil Harris over there. That's a switch. Someone following Phil Harris. But you know... <laughs> When I was there the other night, you were dancing with that fat girlfriend of yours, Skin. Hey, didn't we look swell, Bob? Yeah, she certainly made a handsome-looking couple. <laughs> well, Bob, I had a lot of trouble dancing. I was wearing a suit made out of that kangaroo cloth. Well, what's the matter with kangaroo cloth? Nothing, but every time I take a step, it's two jumps ahead of me. <laughs> well, I heard Art Baker saying that same thing. He said, Pepsi and tooth powder was two jumps ahead of the halfway tooth powders. Well, that's it, Bob. Uh, a young lady asked me about that today. Mr. Baker, what do you mean when you mention halfway tooth powder? Don't most tooth powders clean teeth pretty well? Yes, they do. Yes, there are a lot of pretty good tooth powders. A lot of them will do some of the things that Pepsodent does, but there isn't a single leading brand that'll give you all the advantages to the high degree of effectiveness that you can get from Pepsodent tooth powder. Is that because of irium? Well, in part, yes. Irium is important because it's a super cleansing agent, not excelled by any that you can name. But cleansing is only half the job. Teeth have to be polished. They have to be buffed to make them lustrous and sparkling and brilliant. And unless a tooth powder makes teeth gleam, it's doing only half a job. Well, don't other tooth powders polish too? Well, not the way Pepsodent does. Pepsodent is the outstanding champion in this department because Pepsodent, and only Pepsodent, contains composite metaphosphate, the remarkably safe, effective polishing ingredient. Pepsodent developed it. Pepsodent patented it. And it's so effective that several independent testing laboratories have all reached the same basic conclusion. Namely, Pepsodent Tooth Powder has the power to produce 32% greater luster on teeth 
than the next best leading tooth powder, actually twice as bright as the average of all other brands. Now, that's why Pepsodent can do things no ordinary tooth powder will do. That's why your teeth will feel smoother and look brighter, at least 32% brighter than ever before. Thank you, Mr. Baker. No more halfway tooth powders for me. From now on, I'm saying Pepsodent tooth powder, please. <laughs> And now, Bob Hope presents his version of Lazy Little Daisy. As our scene opens, we find Bob and yours truly running the new Bob Hope ladies' dress and hat shoppy. Oh, say, uh, say, Bill. Yes, Bob? Well, here I am running my own women's dress shop. This will show Paramount I can handle the skirts. <laughs> say, uh, you know, Bob, this store is all right, but you ought to get some more dresses made out of tweed. Made out of what? Tweed. 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 How are you in wild animal calls? <laughs> I'd like to call my agent. Where are we? <laughs> hey, hey. <laughs> what, what's that going by the front door so fast? That's Mrs. Roosevelt going to Jimmy's wedding. <laughs> She's back already. <laughs> Say, Bob, you know, the, you know the wax dummy in front of the store? Well, well, Hedy Lamar just walked by it. Hedy Lamar just walked by the wax dummy? Yeah. Well, what do you know? Candles. <laughs> Say, I meant to ask you, Bill, what about the hats I designed this morning? How are they selling? Oh, fine, Bob. This afternoon, Humphrey Bogart got his first look at the hat we made for his wife. I wonder how long he'll stay up in the hills this time. <laughs> Hello, Hope's Dress and Hat Shop, Hollywood Patterns exclusively. Hello, Chief. This is your assistant, Professor Hello. Colonna. Expert okay. buyer, salesman, designer and cutter, also telephone slugs, three for a nickel. <laughs> Never mind that, Professor. Are you selling any dresses? Yes, boss. I am now measuring Venus de Milo for a dress. Venus de Milo? Yes. How can her old man let her run around like that? <laughs> now, stand still a minute, Venus, while I take your measurements. Length, 52. Waist, 18. Arms. Come, come. Get them out of your pockets, kid. <laughs> Don't you know Venus has no arms? No arms? Very interesting. Very interesting. <laughs> Come here, Veen. <laughs> oh, take that. We learn something new every day, don't we? <laughs> Say, Bob, excuse me, but that construction company called before, and they said that their order was a mistake. They wanted to buy some girders, not girdles. Well, gosh, Bill, how did they find out their mistake? Well, every time the wind blows, the tenth story does a two-way stretch. <laughs> you know, Bob, I, I've, uh, I've been thinking, we should have a big sale. All right, hand me the matches. <laughs> Howard, hand them to me. Not again, we're still smoking from yesterday. <laughs> well, I meant to tell you, Bob, the truck just brought in a new shipment of lingerie, and there seems to be a piece missing. One piece missing? How could that be? Well, I don't know, but that's the first time I ever saw a truck driver wearing lace panties. Bill, those weren't lace panties The union makes them sit on a doily <laughs> Hello? Hello, Hope This is Colonna, the big buyer, seller, exchanger Also room for rent in Uriah <laughs> No children <laughs> Now listen, boss I'm down here at the silk factory getting some silk Tell me, Hope, when silkworms spin a cocoon, they're supposed to spin it around themselves, aren't they? That's right. Silkworms always spin their cocoons around themselves. See, fellas? Now let me out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Colonna, you can't make me believe you're in a cocoon. I just saw you going out to the park. Well, that's right, Hope. I'm out here at the park getting some furs. <laughs> There's a little animal running around in the bushes. Well, grab it, Colonna. It's a chipmunk. Oh, no, Hope. I think it's a skunk. No, it isn't. Grab it. It's a chipmunk. Okay. Here, pussy. Wow! What's the matter, Kelowna? If that's a chipmunk, it's got a wonderful defense program. <laughs> Kelowna, this is the last straw. Oh, well, you use it. I'll drink from the bottle. <laughs> Say, Bill. Yeah? Tell me, how's business well, doing Bob, here? Uh, Bob, I'm a little worried. That queer contraption over there, is that a lady's hat or a malted milk machine? <laughs> Where? Oh, I don't know. I'll, I'll go. I'll see. I wonder what happens if I touch this. It's a hat <laughs> Well, 
Must be one of Hopper's. Say, Bill, business ought to pick up in this dress shop since we hired those two new models to show off our dresses. Look, here they are over there. Let's, let's eavesdrop something on them. Say, say Brenda, what is it, Cobina? <laughs> Wonderful us getting jobs here as models. Yeah. Gee, I hope my figure's all right for modeling. Uh, Cobina, honestly, now, do you think I'm getting middle-aged spread? <laughs> spread? I'd say it was more of a migration. <laughs> Cobina, turn around. Let me look at you. Oh, you got a shape like Landis. Carol Landis? No, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I've got a nice shape. Now, really, don't you think I have an hourglass figure? Yeah, but it's about 45 minutes late. <laughs> Listen, Smarty, you can't talk to me that way. My face has been on many a cover. Magazine or manhole? <laughs> Listen, Brenda, I didn't like that crack. You've been acting awful snooty since the gophers voted you Miss Buck Teeth of 1941. <laughs> oh, you know, last night I dreamed that Clark Gable was chasing me all night. <gasps> oh, what a nightmare. Clark Gable's chasing you, and you call that a nightmare? Sure, he couldn't catch me. <laughs> Say, I was out with a fellow last night who appreciated me. <gasps> and he admired my figure. Oh, gee, you should have heard the way he admired my figure. And then he popped the question. He popped the question? Yeah. But why should I fight Joe Lewis? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's tend to business, Kobe. Uh, do you like my new garters? Yeah, I love your new garters. And they sure hold your knees up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing. What a smart gang. <laughs> well, what do you expect me to make up on the spur of the moment? After all, I'm not George Bernard Shaw. <laughs> well? Let me see your driver's license. <laughs> Pretend like you're working here. Here comes the boss. Oh, hello, girl. Oh, hello, Bobsy. We were just modeling some of your new dresses. Uh, don't I look attractive in this dress? Ooh, I bet I'll attract men like flies. Yes, because you'll attract twice as many flies. <laughs> yes, you will. Say, come on, let's get the store in order. I'm expecting Hedda Hopper. I'll call my assistant. Oh, Kelowna. Honey. Loose eyeballs. <laughs> Stop acting foolish. Kelowna, you get under my skin. Why should I? I've got nothing to hide. <laughs> here comes Hedda now. Hello, Bob. Nice shop you have here. Oh, Hedda, this is Brendan Cabina, the only two of their kind in the world. Really? I thought Adam had four sons. <laughs> well, getting on with the introductions. Professor Kelowna, this is Hedda Hopper. Come again? This is Hedda Hopper. Hopper. Jitterbug, eh? <laughs> Be nice to her, Professor. Miss Hopper is syndicated. Must have been a neat job. The sky doesn't show. <laughs> Say, Hedda, tell me, what do you think you can do for Brendan Cabina? They want to attract men. Can you improve their looks? Well, Bob, looks don't matter so much when it comes to attracting a man. It's the approach that counts. Do you girls approach a man with savoir faire? No, we sneak up behind him with chloroform. <laughs> no, what Hedda means is that when you meet a man, you should play hard to get. That's right. Now, here comes a man through that doorway. I want you to act with dignity and charm. Now, walk toward him casually. One, two, three, go! <laughs> See? I beat you again! <laughs> uh, next week, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back at the same time. And with us as our guest will be Lola Lane, the same gang and... Bob Ho. Thank you, Bill Goodman. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. This is Bill Goodman speaking for Tessimus. It's the National Broadcasting Company.